like to welcome everybody to the show talk, the Imagine Impact Park Day. Uh, we have a dope lineup of uh, speakers, artists, educators, researchers, uh, cultural thinkers, activists, and all the above. And I will give each an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll be moderating, so I'll start with a short intro of who I am. Um, Dr. John Banner, I am the manager of community learning experience at the Urban Art Space. And um, I am co-creator of this show. Not the creator, we'll get more to that in a little bit. Uh, but I've had the honor of uh, seeing the show grow from its inception uh, a little bit over a year ago when the pandemic started to happen. I've been able to just network and converse and engage with wonderful people, artists, community um, organizations, community partners, um, university departments who have a common goal of bringing community together. Um, having diverse conversations around issues which are not always talked about. Um, and art is a wonderful vehicle to do that. Right? Art is universal language, so we're able to really have these tough conversations um, that happen under the surface a lot of times when we bring them to the forefront. Um, so with that being said, I am going to um, pass the mic, per se, um, to the panelists. We'll actually start um, at the end with my good friend, Mario Harrison, and I will let him um, Themselves, what you do, uh, what organizations are with, and uh, anything else you else Hello, everyone. Um, as he stated, I am Mario Hairston. Uh, I work in fashion and the event space. I'm the creative director and apparel buyer for a store here in Columbus called Soul Classic. Uh, and I also have been working in the event space for about 15 years. Uh, I've known this guy for couple of decades, maybe. Uh, so it's been a pleasure working with him and Ayana and the whole team uh, creating this month-long uh, excursion of events. Uh, and it's a pleasure to meet all of you. I've seen a lot of these faces uh, in the gallery day after day and your amazing work. So I'm uh, honored to be here with you guys. Okay, hi, um, I'm Hill Ayana. I am the creator of the show, of the Irrepressible Show. Um, I am an intern at Urban Heights Space, a student at OSU. I graduated in December. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a long time. Um, but I'm a double major, so my majors are African American and African Studies, and I'm getting my BFA in Photography, and then I'm minoring in Arts Entrepreneurship, and I'm, you know, I am getting my Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Certificate. Um, I'm also an artist, so... With my art, I focus on ceramics and photography, really having a conversation about blackness and black beauty, and through my work, trying to liberate people like me. Hi, I'm Sierra Hamilton. I'm also a student at OSU. Um, I am an arts major with a focus in painting and drawing as well as a double minor in arts entrepreneurship and design thinking. I will also be graduating in December of this year. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I am also an intern here at Urban Art Space, as well as a part-time employee at the, Mu the Columbus Museum of Art in the learning and engagement um, department. Like Ayana, I am also an artist. Um, I will I like to say that my work is more of a process and um, multimedia. Whatever I want to do, I just do it. Painting, drawing, chicken wire, the lights, cardboard. Um, but a lot of my work right now is focusing on just healing and using art as a um, means of coping with different diagnoses that I've been given and just like, I don't know, just trying to find myself as a person, and I'm doing that through the arts. Good evening. My name is Dr. Tiffany Bourgeois. I'm a professor here at Ohio State, specifically um, in the Department of Arts Administration, Education, and Policy. I've had the pleasure of working with a variety of people on this panel in different capacities, so I'm very excited to be here. My research focuses on arts and cultural um, institution engagement with sports mega events. So like the Olympics, the Super Bowl, and hopefully I'll be talking about the World Cup one day soon. So thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here and to sit on this panel with these lovely folks.
Good evening. Um, my name is Chris Tsunami. Um, I would consider myself primarily a philosopher. Um, I do a lot of different things, including music and writing, um, but those are all things that I would say relate back to my interest in philosophy and my interest in having an impact on the culture. Um, I uh, ran the Columbus Invitational Arts Competition for seven years, so I was a, um, a organization that promoted um, community arts organizations. Uh, first we did it at the city level and then we eventually did it at the state level and then also at the interstate level. Um, I, I'm also, I'm married to the fantastic artist April Tsunami who's here mm -hmm. in the audience. <laughs> uh, she's hiding her face but uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I consider her one of the great artists of Columbus. Um, <laughs> I'm also, hopefully I'm not getting ahead of myself, but I'm really proud and honored to announce that um, I'm looking into a collaboration with um, Ayana and uh, Dr. Banner to do a um, extension of this year's event next year um, entitled uh, Black Future Month. So I'm really excited about that and hopefully I'm not getting out too far ahead by, <laughs> by announcing that. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Eris Cohen. I am a uh, visual artist, uh, specifically working with acrylic right now, but uh, with interest in all different types of mediums. I am uh, been practicing professionally for almost three years now, but uh, been an artist all my life. Um, I'm fortunate enough, after hearing all of these um, explanations of work and seeing all of the different artists in the show, I'm super fortunate to um, be the feature artist in Irrepressible Soul, um, which is amazing because like I said, there are so many different uh, mediums and, and beautiful pieces of work in this show. Um, I'm thankful to be a part of this panel. I've worked with uh, some people in this panel um, for a while and known one for a very long time. So. Uh, just happy to be here, happy to talk art, and um, I'm a serial learner, so um, looking to hear some things and learn some things today. Be sure, my name is Marshall Shorts, uh, artist, designer, entrepreneur. I run a program branding studio called Art Fluential. Uh, I have a conference called Creative Control Fest that centers black creatives and those who want to see us win. Uh, and also a co-founding member of uh, Maroon Arts Group, uh, which is in the city. Uh, I'm an artist in general, and in my practice, when I get to practice, it's a, it's a number of different media, uh, from photography to painting to design. Um, have the fortune of knowing Eric's probably all my life. We went to school together in Cleveland, mm -hmm. uh, Cleveland School of Arts. Uh, and so, yeah, happy to be here. I met Dr. Teron uh, a couple months ago, or last year, last year. Last year yeah. uh, and so, um, my art primarily has been creating spaces, uh, particularly for black artists and black creatives. Um, and so that's kind of where I've seen most of my creative expression. All right, so really fast, we have a quick round of applause for our viewers. <laughs> questions may be hard to answer, so I really tried to, uh, to quiz them up a little bit, but I want to be conversational in nature, um, so I can call any one person, but feel free to chime in, add in, ask a question to the question, whatever it may be. Uh, so just thinking about black art, thinking about this show and other shows, and just the, the nature of black art, uh, I want to pose this question to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So can you define what black is? In your work, or is that even necessary to define what black is? Um, and if so, is there a balancing act to make art while being black, um, as opposed or in relation to um, making black art? That makes sense. So, yeah, I'll start off with that, and whoever wants to hop in first, feel free to. I can go. Oh. Got it, so, Yeah. This is actually something that I struggle with a lot when I 
not necessarily defining myself as an an artist and like what I would like to do with my work, um, but it is something that I struggle with because like being a black artist is like black enough in in the way that I view my work. Um, just especially since a lot of my subject matter is myself, like. I'm a black woman, you know, that is the blackness in my work. Um, but part of me struggles with wanting to be known for making specific black art in reference to the community as a whole and, um, you know, kind of chiming my voice into that conversation. Um, it's really hard because sometimes I don't, not that I don't feel like I, my voice should be a part of that conversation. I just, I just see people doing really extremely like powerful things, um, and really bringing conversation to things that are happening in our current climate um, in the world. And so for me, it's just like, I don't know, it's really hard. And so I'm really interested in hearing what other people define as blackness in their work and if they feel that they are a black artist outside of the fact that they are simply a black artist. Not simply, <laughs> but a black artist. You wanna? Uh, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've been answering this question all my career. Uh, I think there, one, first and foremost, black is a political statement mm -hmm. yeah. um, inherently, whether you want it to be or not. Uh, but it's also been commodified, right? And so it becomes like its own genre of sort in the art world. Um, and then there's, a, you know, how you define that might change from person to person, right? So uh, is a person who paints black subjects a black artist, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I like to, I probably fall more in the vein of like, black artist is the person who's making it, right? Like, so that person identifies as black or is, black and they are making art, right? Um, and that's, you know, otherwise, like, anybody can just jump in there and, you know, paint black subjects and, and we're calling it black art because somebody black is featured. So, I mean, that's up for debate and, and there has been a debate, right, for, for a very long time in many, in many circles. Um, but I think uh, it, it has to be some intentionality around it. Uh, obviously, you can't necessarily run away from the term or the title, uh, anytime you're in a space <laughs> and you're black or you're the only one, it always comes up. So, you know, for me, I've embraced it and, and I, I think there's a very powerful history there, uh, but that should not, it, it's often used as a limit, a limiting uh, effect in, in certain art spaces. And so I think as opposed to dealing with the title of black artists, we should deal with the systems that seek to sort of identify black artists in a way to keep them out of certain spaces, um, which is not necessarily just the work of black artists to do. So that's my short answer. I could go on for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's a question of a special interest to me. Um, so for me growing up multiracial, uh, I definitely had struggles with my identity, and at a certain point I had to really wrestle with, uh, am I black? And my answer was yes, I am black. And as uh, Marshall said, it's a political statement. Um, the black race in America, the origins of it, um, we're the people whose ancestors could be identified if they ran away. Um, so it was originally um, a business decision that people made to classify because our ancestors are from many different nations. Um, Africa is the most genetically diverse place on earth. So um, we're descendants of cultures that were very widely separated uh, back, on, uh, back on the African continent. So what we are here is something new and black identity is identity. Um, there are people who have black identity who do not appear black. Um, and that comes again from uh, it's a legacy of a time where the decision was made that anybody who had any black blood, as I said, one, one drop of black blood means that you're a black person. Um, but I do think that the reversal of it is that um, it goes from being something that was placed on people and it was a mark of shame 
or mark of servitude to something that um, becomes an identity of pride. Uh, for me, the big thing about claiming black as identity is that um, for me to claim black as identity means that whatever I am and whatever I do is black. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I no longer have to ask myself, am I black enough? Are the things I do black? Um, it's an identity that was originally placed on my ancestors, but by claiming it, um, I transform whatever it is that I do into blackness. I wanted to piggyback on this point of pride. Before I became a, a professor, I was the audience development director at the Ensemble Theater, which is a theater company in Houston, Texas. One of its taglines is the largest black theater in the Southwest. So black was a phrase, a term associated with something to be proud of. And in my work, which has continued since um, leaving that organization, which was a black organization, and served <laughs> black folks and presented black art, um, my work has expanded um, to think about this at the organizational level as well. Specifically when we think about funding of arts organizations and what that means. So according to grant makers um, in the arts, 6% of under-recognized organizations, so BIPOC, fill in, the, fill in the phrase that you would like to use today, um, receive comparable funding from individual donors to organizations serving mostly white patrons. So when my work looks at these sports mega events, such as the Super Bowl, I look at how arts organizations that don't receive funding normally because of systemic issues can access these one-time funds that are associated with this experience. So when I think about black and how is it defined in my work, which is research, I think about it at the organizational level. I also think about who is being served and how. I just wanted to add one comment. Mm -hmm. Me and Eris grew up in Cleveland in a predominantly like black school. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll speak for myself, I can't speak for you. I never had to think about being a black artist until I was in predominantly white spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll just leave that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to that. To that point, I was thinking about uh, what, what Chris was saying about how you have to, how being black is a business decision. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like Marshall just said, growing up there at School of Arts, it, it wasn't even on our minds, but um, having, <laughs> having been jaded about being an artist and then finding my passion for it again, or it finding me, I have that issue today where I know I'm a black artist. I'm a lot more than that too. But in calling myself that, in just intrinsic, intrinsically being a black artist, I feel like I'm in spaces where that's all I'm seen as. Or uh, as it pertains to my work being seen or understood, um, it's not the only subject matter that I have. There are other things that I, I, I'm interested in or other stories that I'm, I'm willing to tell, but I don't, um, I don't enjoy the feeling of being in certain spaces and feeling categorized as such, um, as if, as if that's all there is to it. Um, I think that in certain spaces, it's looked at as just a thing still, um, as it was in the past. So um, piggybacking off of what everyone said, I think that's the importance of this space. Um, with each artist that's in the show, it's 27. Everybody is making work about their identity and their path. So for us, like as black people going into this space, this is just our life. You, you're in a room full of artists and of course, everywhere else, this is a this is a black art show, mm -hmm. and I have had thoughts about okay, am I okay with that? And I am, because if this is the way for black artists to be recognized in a space that's predominantly white, 
ran by white men, then so be it. There's a long way we have to go, but to have this as a step and stone to help increase arts equity and accessibility changes a lot. And then for me as an artist, I'm okay with being known as a black artist because that's the subjects I talk about. So when it comes to ceramics, I'm going to discuss how black women autonomy is taken away from them and how through that I'm reclaiming that or looking at photos and thinking about how lighting can set the stage of the spiritual nature of black people and the regalness that exists within us. And if for it to be seen as considered as black art, then it's okay. But while we are black artists, we are just artists, but that comes with being black wherever you go is, oh, this is black, this is black. And that's just the society that we live in. <clears throat> um, my perspective and opinion is slightly different because I'm not a traditional artist like most people here. Um, for me, I never thought about being black because I grew up in a black neighborhood. I grew up around all black people, but I did struggle with in my artists. Um, I never, I didn't grow up around artists outside of Toronto. Um, I didn't have any friends who were in the arts. I didn't hang around people who were in the arts of any such. So I struggled with, is that a, 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 is that a path I can go down? Is that an opportunity that's even available to me? I don't see it, you know, I didn't know what the create, you know, expressing my creativity, I didn't know what that looked like, it felt like. So I never struggled with being a black artist. I struggled with what does being an artist look like? And so that's the importance of being a black artist to me today is that other people who grew up in my community and my neighborhoods who don't know how to express, express their creativity or see what a future could look like expressing their creativity. Can you make a living doing it? You know, what, do I have to be in the gallery? Do I have to know how to draw? You know, it's just a lot of questions that you have about being a creative and coming up where, you know, in a black community, in an impoverished community, you have no choice but to be creative. You know, you're limited resources. So being creative is a part of your DNA. So for me, it's important to show people and that look like me and come from the place I come from that um, being a creative looks completely different for everyone and that there is um, opportunities and outlets for you to express yourself and do it for a living and, and not, you know, the starving artist is, you know, not just the, the starving artist, it's not just means you can't, you know, excel, exceed in life being a creative. So. Yeah, so I'll chime in really fast and keep my answer pretty short, but I think um, hearing all of your answers, one thing that's popping into my mind is how do we experience identities, right? How do we experience race? Because race is an ascribed or a described, self-described identity. And the only way to do that is through our lived experience, right? So when you're a black artist, um, your, your sensibility derives from being black. There's no question about that. Um, but you're making art. Right, you're making art from your experience. So yes, it's black art, but it's more about how you experience things. And art in itself is about uh, conveying and having a, a social kind of conversation about what's going on in the world. Um, so I think that's an important conversation to have, right? I think you can't get away from being black artists, but we're making art for research or uh, we're working within the, the creative economy at a very universal level, uh, the highest level, right? So it should be defined as black art or black work, but we can't deny that it is derived from our sensibility of being black in this world and how we experience being black in society. So, um, okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, I'm going to combine maybe some points. So think about your work, your research, your art, um, and what you're trying to bring to the forefront, what you're trying to convey, or the message you want to um, have in a conversation. Is there something that's unrecognizable to those who don't live this experience? Right, you don't, um, you know, have this ascribed or self-described identity of being black. And if so, what is that? What is that unrecognizable part that you're trying to bring to the forefront, or the conversation you're going to have that's not being had, or just anything important? Like that? I don't know if this is exactly answering the question, but 
for me, and also kind of going back to that first question, I think where that struggle for me, like, obviously I am very proud to be a black woman. I am proud to be a part of the black community and being surrounded by black people is extremely important to me. In the same breath, it's so hard for me sometimes to like get out of my head about like blackness because I grew up in areas where it was predominantly somebody else. Like I grew up in Texas, so it was like predominantly predominantly Hispanic people, Colorado, Georgia. And so now finally being in a space that is, you know, OSU is a PWI, but being surrounded by people of all kinds of cultures Wait, 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 hold on. Mm-hmm. I just like, lost the complete track of mm-hmm. being surrounded by other cultures. It makes me like, just just because there's so many people who are proud of their identity, it makes me like, oh yes, yes, like I should be proud of that too. And I think part of my work is also kind of vocalizing that even though I, it seems like, oh yes, you know, proud to be black sometimes it is still I'm still trying to vocalize that sense of like trying to find who I want to be who I am and I kind of spoke about that a little bit in um, my piece back to the earth from which I came which is like honestly talking about how it is about mental health but part of that is my experiences as a black woman because I used to talk to this man (laughs) Um, who was white, who had very recently told me that he wished I was a white woman. And I just think that that, and it, it sh- I shouldn't have let it bother me, but I come back to some of those experiences in my work and it's just, people wouldn't know that unless I say it. Like some of this is about mental health, but a lot of that stems from a lack of defining who I am. Um, I don't remember the rest of the question, so I'm gonna pass this along. Okay. Um, I think a lot of my work may be seen as unrecognizable, but that comes from a place of, um, if you haven't experienced my path, then there's things that you won't understand, and that's okay. So with that, um, because I am an artist, but I also believe in art as research, and there's a reason why I have two majors, so I can study what I'm making art about. But just thinking about as an artist, how can I take my art and make it an installation and an immersive experience versus something that's on the wall two-dimensionally? How can I provoke different senses in order to create a feeling then in dialogue that hopefully allows the audience, regardless of the background, to then go on their then go and research what my art is about or even have a conversation with me. So while it may be unrecognizable, I'm willing to talk about it and I want it to be set up in a way where the audience can be immersed in it to help understanding of the conceptual underpinnings of my work. Um, that's a tough question. Uh, unrecognizable, I think, yes. Just the, the easy answer is yes, of course, right? It's, uh, it's derived from our experience, there may be some. But I don't think that's just relegated to, like, folk out of the black community. I think that changes from community to community. When I go to Chicago, like, the, the slang is different. Uh, but there's some familiarity in the black experience. Kind of like if you know, you know. Um, but uh, my most accessible practice has been photography for the last few years, just because it's, it's the easiest to get to, and, and I can kind of take that with me everywhere. Uh, so I did a series where I was just documenting black men in my life uh, in joyful moments. And uh, when I printed the, the images for a show, I cropped them really closely, um, you know, like in your face. And so what I really, the responses I got from that, um, particularly from, from folk outside of the black community and some folk in the community, is that they hadn't been in close proximity to black men in that way. Um, so they, they were lacking intimate experiences with 
black men in this instance, but probably black people in general, right? Um, and so uh, I was getting like messages. I showed at Uppercut, for instance, and like every day somebody was hitting me up, like, hey, I was at Uppercut, and I just, I felt an immense joy, right? Um, because there were all these like 20, 16 by 16 inch pictures of, of black men smiling. And so, um, you know, I think in that regard, like the unrecognizable aspect was in that like proximity uh, to, to the blackness in a, in a certain kind of intimate way. Um, and I think that's the part that is somewhat unrecognizable. It's easy to kind of view it in a gallery um, amongst, you know, other things, but when it's like confronting you in a certain kind of way, when art confronts you in a certain kind of way that forces an intimacy, I think that's where that contradiction is happening. To be a black artist, to do black art, it's, it's a choice situation because um, your art has to either be um, art of resistance or it has to be complicit. And the reason is it's neutrality isn't really an option for a black artist because neutrality means uh, the status quo and the status quo as we know is not, um, the status quo is harmful to, to the black community and members of the black community. So um, one of the things that I think is unrecognizable probably to most, um, most of the mainstream audience is just the humanity of black people. Uh, bec because for so many years, the only depictions of black people that made it into the mainstream were de not depictions by black people. Um, so even, even things like characters on a sitcom or in a movie, um, you know, there might be, they might resemble black people. They might have some of the rhythms, some of the look, but there wasn't that kind of lived experience. Um, and I do, think that's, I do think that lived experience is very unrecognizable to a lot of people in the, in the wider audience. And that's, that's why art like this is so important because it's a reflection of what black people look like through the eyes of, of black artists. And it's, it's a different look, um, even from the most well-intentioned person who's looking at it from the outside. One thing I'll add to that, and this is kind of piggybacking on what you just said, is, um, I think there has always been an effort to try and describe or channel what the black basin is. Right? If you think about fast black art, the art movements like the black arts movement, or even the Negro and the Harlem Renaissance, right? They try to capture, well, what is it? I put blackness into sound, or blackness into text, or blackness into color, or what it is. Um, and even after program, at the same point in the professor. And they focused on three different things, right? Uh, past, present, and future. And how are they used to change the way? How they're circular and not a straight line. Uh, so taking that and thinking about you know past black art movements, how they were about the generation or uh, civil rights or economic freedom or cultural freedom or ownership, autonomy. Um, do you see any of the past, present, and future either? Your work um, or in the direction of black art now? Or what, what is the direction that you see art moving going currently? Okay. Um, I do believe, and I talk to Dr. Banner about this all the time, that we're in a new black renaissance. And in 20 years, you'll see it written in a history book of some sorts. I think we're in a place and time where black people we're able to be creatives and be innovators and have ownership. And the fact that we're able to have this ownership is fostering this environment. So you have organizations like Maroon Art Groups that's popping up. You have Rio and a lot of other people that's the main creatives and can solely do that. Um, and then amazing artists like Sierra and art educators like Dr. Bourgeois and Dr. Banner that's in this space and they're taking this space. And um, because we're able to adapt these roles, roles that we were never able to take before. And when we're thinking about Afrofuturism also, we're able to advance. Um, yeah, I think inherently black people are innovative and the nature of innovation 
is required for us to survive. And right now we're all doing that. So to see this space of black artists, black creatives grow, I think it's a good one. And it's a lot of places that we're gonna go in this. Whenever you ask the question, a couple things, well, one thing as a through line sticks out to me, and it's to ensure that artists are paid. Not just paid, but paid a living wage. And when I think about my work and the research that I'm doing, I note the disparities, which we are all well versed in, but I also believe in finding innovative ways, unique ways to ensure that black artists, black organizations, are supported so that they have the funds and the resources to do the, this creative work. So when I consider where we're going and my role or, my sp or the space that I will take up, um, that is in the forefront of my mind, ensuring that the funds, the support, and the resources are there so that the, so that the artists can do what they need to do. <laughs> you, I mean, this is my bag, so when you talk about Africa Opera and mm -hmm. Black Arts Movement, um, I think, you know, politically, I align in that, mm -hmm. in that way, you know, um, like Black Liberation and, and, and art as a vehicle for Black Liberation. Um, and I think, you know, we talk about, like, so we did a, a, a platform, we're building a platform for our Deliver Black Dreams, which kind of came out of the 2020. Um, uh, resistance and, uh, and uh, part of that was uh, using cultural production as an entry point into the conversation. And so, uh, as a part of that effort, we stood up like three uh, large scale murals in the city under this theme of the Little Black Dreams. And um, one of the pieces that I designed uh, was inspired by an African culture member, I think uh, Barbara Jones Ho, I think that's it. Uh, and, uh, and then a quote from Fred Hampton. And so um, I think it's important uh, that we look to the past um, as, as a guy. I think Michael Lynch said, you know, history is best qualified to reward our research. And my mentor would add and guide our actions. And I think uh, for artists, uh, as researchers, as um, anthropologists, as, as so many things that we are, I think it's important to have a foundation um, I think even Du Bois has a quote talking, saying that all art is propaganda, right? Um, that it serves a particular cultural interest, whether it's trying to be or not. You know, a, a museum served a purpose in the culture of white supremacy in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, to disengage from that is your choice, uh, but it does not mean that the art that we are making um, is in any way disengaged from the moment. And so when we look back in 20 years, um, much like the Harlem Renaissance, which was one of the most violent times against black people in the nation, right? There were lynch mobs, there was like more lynchings during that time. And so when we parallel that to what happened in 2014 and, and since then, right? You know, we can't just look at it from 2020, like this has been going on over decades, but you know, this dispensation of like Black Lives Matter really kind of kicked off in Ferguson in 2014. Um, and you can kind of, you know, correlate the, the creative explosion, this artistic renaissance with this uh, repression and, and state violence and, you know, vigilante violence, right? It, it's, it's not untethered. So while, you know, artists are definitely getting the bag right now, it, it is also not separated from, you know, a, a very sort of antagonistic moment against the black community, right? which can oftentimes opens that door. And sometimes the easiest vehicle to do that is through culture, cultural expression and cultural production, um, be, when it's not intentionally being political, right? And I think, uh, I'll stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did do a manifesto inspired by the Black Arts Movement, so BAM did a manifesto, uh, and so did Afrocobra. And if you ever intrigued, I did a print version of it. If you want a copy, I think I got some of my house studio, but it's online at blackcreativesmanifesto.com. So for me, it's very 
sort of steep in what I do, whether that's, you know, through the vehicle of, you know, fashion or music or whatever, right, it's still tethered to the moment and not in isolation uh, as we just an artist create, you know what I mean, so. Come on, I'm really fast. I gotta, I gotta take you back off the back of my to your point, I definitely agree. Um, I just wrote an article a little while ago called uh, Black Art, Black Grand Age, and Black Lives Matter. Right? So I think Black Lives Matter are the, the art we're seeing come from that is a continuation of these past movements, right? Where black Rage is being channeled. Um, black Rage isn't a bad thing, right? That there's righteous reciprocity and righteous justice. Um, but I, I also think that, as I thought here, that the black art we're seeing is a continuation of what's been going but so are the, the cultural policies and mm -hmm. the arts administration. Arts administration. You think about uh, my black, mm -hmm. right? That's this mm -hmm. great autonomy. That was pushed with the Black Brother Party, the Black Arts Party, right? We're thinking about um, creative coalitions. We had Jam, we had just no Midtown, we had all these different uh, places that were created during this time. And we're seeing that continue today, right? So I don't think it's uh, not connected. I should say, I also think that the Black and White Matter movement has learned from these past movements, right? Even in the black power movement, the black arts movement, while they were, um, of course, they're good, there were things that were bad, right? There was sexism, there was toxic masculinity, etc. Um, black lives matter came, they affirmed all black lives, right? So I think we continue to learn um, and improve, but also keep our foundation core tenets and the core principles that were so important for, you know, the addressing civil rights and using art as a vehicle cultural sister of the liberation movement. Art has always been a component of social media, so I see this as a continuation of that. I really love this question because I, I think that um, the past and the future and understanding them are so important to kind of being free in the present. Um, when I was a kid, I was a big fan of science fiction, but at that time, it was almost impossible to find any black people in science fiction. Um, and it's not because there were no people who wanted to write science fiction, but uh, by and large, black authors were not published in science fiction. Um, and so the future looked very white at that point. Um, I remember reading somebody, they said like if um, the, the vision was of a future with no black people in it. That's what people were imagining. Um, Things have really changed a lot. Um, the, I would talk a little bit about Black Future Month, and that comes from an essay by the science fiction writer M.K. Jemison. Um, she's a black science fiction author, and she actually is one of the most highly awarded science fiction authors ever. And a lot of people uh, don't realize that. She's the only person to have won the Hugo Award, which is one of the biggest awards in science fiction, three times in a row for the same series. Um, so. When she was talking about Black Future Month, she was talking about how important it is for us to be able to imagine ourselves in the future. Uh, that's why I love Afrofuturist work, like uh, Eris's work here on the wall, and just kind of the, the sense of the future and the possibilities. Um, but I think we also need to ground things in the past. Um, if you guys will indulge me in um, a couple, I'll make them brief, but stories about history and the ways that understanding history differently kind of freed my mind. Um, one of the, the other experiences I had growing up was I always felt like an outsider. Um, I always felt like a foreigner. Um, you know, I always felt like I was looked at as being somebody who didn't belong. Uh, something that I eventually found out from my own family history that was really eye-opening to me was that um, my uh, grandfather's distant ancestor was actually um, uh, a black Revolutionary War soldier who was um, given land here in Ohio. And his descendants lived here since that time, and they were never enslaved. And it was interesting to me to realize that um, even though I felt like the outsider, like I'm actually somebody whose family has been in this place for a very long time, a lot longer than a lot of the people who are looking cross-eyed at me. Um, another example that's uh, less personal, more global, is um, just looking at kind of world history. Uh, a lot of times we hear about like the Roman Empire and we know that it's kind of celebrated as a symbol of white supremacy. 
what a lot of people don't realize is that it was a very multiracial society. Um, one of the emperors of Rome was actually uh, North African. Um, and there was a time period where uh, black people, sub-Saharan black people, um, were full Roman citizens. Um, I think it's important to know that because if we look back at the past and we see these, you know, whenever the Roman Empire is depicted, if there's a black person, they're always a slave, they're fanning somebody with a giant feather or something. And if you see that and if you think that's what the past is, then you can't envision anything different for the future because then it looks like, oh, things have been like this for thousands of years. But when you realize, no, things have not been like this for thousands of years and there were other cultures that were able to be multicultural and able to celebrate uh, people of different racial heritages, then you realize, no, maybe we're the anomaly. Maybe we're the ones who are not um, in line with history. Personally, to me, it looks like collaboration. It looks like um, embracing and loving the people that you work with on a daily basis, the people you have access to, the people who uh, support and embrace you naturally, uh, your peers, and not seeking things beyond that, not seeking things that aren't seeking you, not um, working for uh, validation from things and, and individuals who aren't a part of, who aren't naturally embracing you on a day-to-day -day basis. Collaboration with your peers is, to me, the number one way for, you know, not to only the fulfillment that comes with it, but to grow. And we see it, you know, we've been working together for a year to pull this off, and we've met so many people in our circle, started with, you know, us three, and now, you know, I know so many more people. You know, you know, we all just have grown this thing in such a short time and have put together some things that individually we could not have done. And I think that's just a testament to the power of collaboration and what can come from it. So to me, that, that's the, the answer to that question. Well, I was going to say collaboration, too. Um, I think, well, just growing up in my family, but also, like, this is a shared experience with a lot of black people, or even if you could just go back to the roots, it, it truly takes a village. Um, it takes a village to fit things together. It takes a village to support. It takes a, it just takes a village. And uh, without that, none of this could happen. Also, um, oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. So I wanna pass it and I wanna remember it again, but I had a second point. I forgot. <laughs> I would say that um, it looks like this space right now, this show. Um, everything that is encompassed in, in this conversation we're having, um, that's what black love or, or support for black art and, and love for black art is. Um, I also want to uh, point out the Columbus art scene. Um, having come from Cleveland, um, I, I'm not sure what it is right now. You know, I've been here for 20 years now. Um, and hadn't been practicing art until a few years ago. And just in, in, in months with, the, you know, dealing with Maroon Arts Group, having my first show with them and getting a start there. By October of last year, I'm in a show that's curated by nine, you know. Um, and I'm just meeting so many different people, having uh, had the chance to uh, collaborate with uh, Urban Art Space so many different times and all of the different work um, and, and people that I've met like this. It's so easy to feel supported and to um, to make connections uh, in this art scene. And so although there are nuances, um, I was in the workforce not long ago and, and being a manager in a hotel uh, during the pandemic, was pretty difficult, um, to say the least. And uh, you deal with a lot of workplace drama and that kind of thing. And, and so when I made this leap to, to follow my passion, 
I couldn't imagine having the same issues I did in the hotel. And I can honestly say I haven't. Like I said, there are nuances, uh, there, there's issues. I'm, I'm a Franklinton resident, um, you know, and in a lot of my work, I, I, I talk about uh, different things that, you know, I go through as a black person, but a lot of other people go through as well, gentrification being one of those situations. Um, and, and, and so, although there's these different hurdles that are still there, uh, that I know we need to get through. Um, I just, I, I have to point out, you know, aspects where I do feel supported and um, urban art space. Pass the mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got two parts. So I have a response in terms of artists and artists loving what they do. I think, um, that's the first step, and, and I think a part of that is it's engaging uh, from the cap capitalist <laughs> hamster wheel of the art world. Um, and I don't mean don't get your back, but disengaging in the sense of uh, how we value ourselves and how we value our art before we put it up for sale. And, I, and, I, and personally, like there was a point in time where if it wasn't making me money, I felt like it wasn't valuable. And that is the wrong, that's the worst thing you can do as an artist, right? Uh, because there's the art industry and then there's you as the individual. Now, the industry <laughs> can fund black artists exponentially, uh, give us more space, uh, give us more access, right? Uh, for a long time, art spaces, museums, galleries, has have invisible walls, right? We know there, there, there's the, the opening before the opening that collectors get to go to. So not just, you know, artists, you know, in the gallery, but, you know, people who might want to grow as patrons, right? Uh, or collectors, right? And I think um, as an industry, there's a lot more that we can do that, that can show love to uh, black artists. Um, the, the quintessential question we're asking to deliver black dreams, for instance, is what does it look like for a city or a state or country to love black folk? And I would ask that question to the artist industry, right? And if you start with that question, then you can, you know, start answering that question through action, right? So what you're doing, um, you know, what we try to do with Maroon Arts Group in, in terms of like, you know, our little gallery out of shipping container, you know, being an entry point for artists who maybe never shown in a gallery space before, but it's not, it's not as intimidating as an urban art space because the size is, you know, Half this, half this room right here, just this room right here, right? Like, so I think, um, I think there is uh, a lot we can do in terms of how we show love, how we show access, how we fund artists, um, and 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 then um, how we change policy to uh, you know acknowledge. And these aren't just issues with black artists; this is arts industry as a whole. But uh, you know, the definition of policy. In Columbus or art, there is no arts policy, right? Like there is just it just says art that's hung on the wall or something like that, right? And so I think that we have to, uh, as artists, organize ourselves much like the artists did uh, during the Black Arts Movement to advocate as citizens as well, um, and not also separate so much from uh, the communities that we live in, and that our art can also be used uh, in those spaces, um, and that our art can be recognized beyond the gallery wall. Um, and, 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 and more in the built environment, so, yeah. I wanted to piggyback on, I think everybody's touched on this, but when we're thinking about people who are talking about supporting the arts or engaging with specifically black artists, I wanna make sure that I name a couple folks because their work is trying to push us forward. And I think it's important for all of us to know. So if you have a chance and would like to read some academic articles, um, I would highly recommend looking into Antonio Kyler's work, especially surrounding arts leadership, um, Bria Heidelberg's work, um, especially when it comes to thinking about whew, unions, collective bargaining, and also, um, <laughs> Also uh, talking about anti-discrimination works as well. And then Jaleesa Wells, 
she's doing some work right now on on um, communities of color. And these are some scholars that I think are trying to tackle some of the issues that we've talked about, tackle some of the thoughts that we've, or some of the questions that we've had. And um, I think that it would be great to make sure we support these black creators, scholars as well. Her, um, his name is Antonio Kyler, C-U-Y-L-E-R, Bria Heidelberg, um, H or B R E A H E I D E L B E R G and Jaleesa Wells J L E E S A Wells like W E L L S. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so the next question. I'm gonna read this. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, so, post painting on the heels of George Floyd and Neil. Other events that have exposed racism and white supremacy in society. There has been an increased demand for diverse art, critical conversations um, in the private sector, in academia, mm -hmm. and the alike. Right? How do we, as artists, creatives, researchers, activists, etc., um, ensure that we develop genuine connections mm -hmm. and that those genuine connections produce real change? Very, very briefly, and I, I keep forgetting because I just started to teach, um, giving back, giving back to uh, and, and giving to the next generation. So making sure that uh, I'm, I'm, I teach high school, Franklinton High School, um, and I also teach at All That, uh, which is a very nice program that, that helps children have vocational learning and gives them, gives them you know, uh, ideas of what they can do for in the future uh, for themselves when they don't feel like they have a lot of connections. So making sure that um, they understand that you can be an entrepreneur. Uh, I don't recall really being taught that, that much in, in, in high school. Um, and that's one of the ways to make sure that there's real connections for change in the future. Uh, or even right now, because you know there's even more opportunity for the youth than they realize. Okay, um, so I think, I don't know, can you set a question one more time? Okay, all right, last okay. Um, thank you. So on the heels of all of that, right, yeah. all the, the um, civil unrest, the protests, the activism, um, the pain, the suffering, so on, et cetera. How do we, as artists, educators, activists, uh, individuals, ensure that we are forming authentic connections mm -hmm. and genuine connections, and how do we produce real change as opposed to lip service or Putting on an event and saying we, you know, all we support black lives, we support diverse conversations. Okay, I know where I was going with this. Okay, so um, in this past year, um, first things first is being intentional about what you want to change and why you're doing what you're doing. So just sitting down and we're talking about this show and the beginnings of it, we want to change how black art is seen and where it's seen at and how it's supported. And with that, if you're discussing black art, like Eris was saying, you have to care about the community. So from that, and we're thinking about programming, being intentional about what the programming is and where it's at and how accessible it is, you have to increase accessibility. And then um, I think all our collaborations were authentic and that came from a conversation and understanding that we mutually agree on the cause. And I think that's important. Um, you were talking about how the political place we are in now fostered the organizations like OSU to say, okay, let's, let's support this now. I think there's two things. Number one, a lot of big organizations have no choice but to do it currently. But what's so great about that is within those organizations, you encounter people that want to help and they actually really do care about their cause. So within OSU, who are those people who want to help? And um, I'm gonna say Laura right now because Laura's sitting right here. Just, and it's more, but like Laura really caring about diversity. Um, everybody that's up here from OSU, 
Lisa Florman, Maurice Stevens. So within that, approaching um, larger organizations in the same sense to where the people that you're working with actually cares about the cause versus this show being like the diversity quote for I wish you to look good with the funding. Because there was a lot of funding, which the climate of let's promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think that probably helped the amount of funding that was received for the show. But I know that the people that were in charge of that were genuine with it. So that makes a difference. I might just add, um, I will be brief, I promise. Um, whenever we think about producing change and making sure that it's real, I think about accountability. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, takes a form of resistance as well. So if we're going to ensure that X, Y, and Z is occurring or X, Y, and Z um, uh, is happening now, but also in the future, and it doesn't, then we have to hold entities accountable. And if they are not, then we resist in a variety of ways that we could all discuss. But I just wanted to toss that out there. I, th I think uh, there's really two things that seems to me that I look at in terms of these community conversations. Um, one is kind of external. I, I think it really is important to stay in conversation with the larger community, so outside the black community. Um, and I know that can be difficult, and a lot of times it's um, not as rewarding as we might hope it would be, but I think, I think it's important because um, we are part of a global world. And we, it's great for us to be in this space and for it to be a safe space, but we also need to be in conversation with the larger world. Um, the other thing, though, I think is internal, and it's also a communication thing. Um, Columbus is a place that I, I think a lot of ways it's not as racially segregated as a lot of places, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean there's not separation. And uh, there's a real big separation in Columbus within the black community between the black middle class and then uh, black people without as much money. Um, one thing that I would love to see for an exhibit like this is to really see more of the, the community, maybe the community that doesn't have as much resources, um, get to experience this because I think this could be really transformative for a lot of people. Um, the other place of segregation I see is that uh, generational um, and by age and um, one of the interesting things to me is that um, I know at least three almost completely separate black arts communities in Columbus. And um, there's the black elders. Um, then there's kind of the people um, sort of the middle age category. And then uh, coming here, I was exposed to a completely different group and it's just, it always amazes me how little communication there is between those groups. Um, and I would love to see more bringing the, the black elders into a space like this so that they can see and experience this. Uh, what are you doing what you're doing uh, with the urban art space when we have the opportunity? Uh, I think I wrote down, we must persist. So like, at a point those windows, those doors start closing up real slow. Like we were about it in, 2020 and then 2022, like, mm -hmm. how are we on to the next thing? And so I think part of our job as artists is to persist. Uh, and that requires collective action. That requires us working together uh, to make noise. Uh, so as much as it fatigues us, <laughs> it should tire them out too, right? And they should get tired of hearing us. We should be doing and supporting each other's events. Uh, we should be creating collectives that collaborate and things together and I think um, you know if anything history shows us uh, it's persistence is what I mean we, we're here today because of persistence because somebody before us uh, made the pathway you know what I mean for us to be in this space and so I think uh, we have to uh, remember that, that these institutions aren't going to do this just out of the goodness out of their heart right like there's always the OSU Extension Center came out of student organizing uh, and resistance, right? And I think uh, 
we have to kind of keep that in mind. And I know it's easy for us artists to, you know, like, we, like everybody who we are, we sensitive about our, right? <laughs> and so I think it's easy for us to kind of get into a corner and be by ourselves. And, and we need that space too, but we also have to kind of venture out and build community and utilize our, our talents uh, with the community uh, of by and for and with, right? And I think um, that's that's how we continue this, you know, and, and teaching. So I think, you know, I'm just touching on every, what everybody already said, like, we have to bring youth into this. We have to make sure we're connected with the elders so we know what happened. You know, there's a history of black artists in Columbus. You mentioned Jan, just above Midtown in New York. Uh, She's from Columbus, the woman who started that gallery, that contemporary art gallery in Midtown, New York, is from Columbus, right? And so uh, that's just history we wouldn't know. We, we had to go all the way to the moment to find that out, right? And so I think it's important. There's a, there's a deep history in Columbus that I think we haven't really tapped into. And I think to Chris's point, it's because we became become a little siloed uh, in, in certain ways. So I think this public discourse is very important. I think everyone has touched on this uh, in a different way, but personally, uh, I touched on it earlier, exposure, um, not just to current artists and not just to, you know, exposing people to different resources, which is very important, but to the future artists who may not know that they're artists yet, um, to the people who don't know how to express their creativity, like I said before, um, but giving them that exposure that these spaces exist, that these opportunities exist, that um, these people exist, people who are here to help you and educate you and guide you uh, through your creative journey. All right, so this will be the last question. I actually want to ask it to one person. Um, so just sign down the heel. Creator, uh, curator, intern extraordinator. Uh, this is for you. And then we'll open up for a few questions. Okay. Uh, so what do you believe the significance is for an exhibition program series such as this your show, right? And ultimately, um, what do you hope us and others would take away from experiencing? Okay, um, <laughs> starting with the importance. I think it's just important to see this many black artists um, with different intersectional backgrounds because we're, there's so many different paths in blackness that exists and having that as an example of what blackness is, I think is important. And then um, thinking about it in an immersive nature, so the immersive nature of the exhibition, the immersive nature of the collaboration and the programming that's going on is important. I think too, on the, the backside that everyone won't be able to see, but I think it's so important for people to understand how different black creatives were able to come together and put this together. Um, regardless of what organization you're tied to, there's power in the collaboration, there's some power in trying to increase accessibility. Um, I think it's just showing black people in this way is important, like growing up, I was able to see some art because my mama, so thank you, mom. Um, she's in early childhood development, but growing up, everybody, they don't get to see this. Um, I, number one, hope that for kids, they can look at this show and see themselves within it. And from there, it sparks something. Like what Mario was talking about earlier, I think that's important. I think it's important for people outside of us to see the brilliance and beauty that exists, but most importantly, us seeing the brilliance and beauty that exists within us, in our culture, in our way of life. And I think that in this exhibition, which I hope comes across to everyone else, we're able to see that. So I think I answered your question. You did, Marcy. Going back to the board, I'll work you that. Can you plug what you did with some of the high school in terms of accessibility, funding, and Oh, this okay. I got you. So, um, part of the show and thinking about different backgrounds, um, we wanted to make sure that we got two high school students. So, we worked with Sydney Irving from Afrocentric, 
and we're able to get two to be in the show um, through this grant writer. Thank you, Dr. Banner, um, mm -hmm. for helping. We were able to ensure that everyone was able to get paid for being a part of the show, which I think that's very exciting. In Columbus, there's not enough of artists getting paid, especially black artists. And the skills I learned in Dr. Bourgeois's class, <laughs> can't forget about that. So uh, the high schoolers were also able to get paid. And then we're also thinking of accessibility based on who can view the art and who else can be in the show. So there is a online exhibition scholarship that we were able to get with um, the grants also to where 20 black artists will be chosen to be on the online portion of the exhibition. And two of those artists will receive $400 scholarships to go towards art. That window is closing June 10th. So if you know some black artists, tell them to go to uas.osu.edu slash event slash every principal so <laughs> and the application is right there um event wise there's a lot of events going on we had now three so we had confluence for airs that's so classics we had the opening reception this panel and then this weekend tomorrow for five to nine we have a free black health and wellness event that's happening at columbus commons there'll be some physical activities a black farmer's market, um, free fruit given out, and just a place where you can relax to help promote wellness and health overall, but especially in the black community. Um, then the following day, we have the ball. The ball is a black tie event celebrating fashion and expression as art and music. So come to that. The tickets are on someone's Instagram. Um, if you go to Urban Art Spaces, you'll see that. Um, that's going to be an amazing event. And then the next weekend, in collaboration with a lot of people, um, <laughs> there's so many names, I'm not going to list them all, but Juneteenth on the Ave is happening for the second year, and we'll be out there with Foundations of the Future. So we're looking at the 50th year of hip-hop and celebrating that. So if you come there, you can experience the four elements of hip-hop, and also two more that we think that should be added, fashion and knowledge and look at that the history and where it's going so afrofuturism that's the 17th the next week there's a lot of events guys so i'm sorry for talking this long um on the 22nd we're gonna start off that thursday with an afrofuturism workshop led by dr banner who actually created a course in aep called so yeah, you'll get a little bit of that in that um, <laughs> workshop. And then the next day in collaboration with the Kings Art Complex and of course So Classics. We're collaborating with So Classics for all the programming. I don't think I've said that, but um, we're gonna celebrate or tradition in the art of spoken word and what it means to the black community with the open mic night. Um, that is at the Kings Art Complex from 6.30 to 9 o'clock and all the proceeds from that, the tickets are $5, but the proceeds go to community learning and engagement, to urban art space, and Kings Art Complex, so we can actually do community work. Um, and if you're like worked with any organization with community work, you know that that section of the organization is the hardest to get funding for. Um, and then thanks to the OSU Arts and Science Engagement Team, they are gonna match the fund too. Then in that morning with artist Chineze, whose work is actually right here, um, we're gonna have a Black Girl Miracle Workshop looking at storytelling through the lens of photography. And then I promise the next weekend is the last two events. And um, on Friday, Artist Commune is an event we have monthly at Urban Art Space where the artists and can, the community can get together and create, view, and discuss art. This time we are collaborating with the Black Art Collective, Al Six. Um, to put on something very special. And the last day is the celebration because black people, we celebrate everything. So that's the reason why there's an opening and the closing. So come to those events, all this information will be at the same page I said earlier. Or if you go to Urban Art Space, um, the website just in general, you'll be able to find it.
Off that just strength right there that you feel like you're not being seen um, and a lot of the stuff I do I don't just think about myself I think about the people that's going to come after me so it's important for me to accept the role as an artist and keep pushing past everything regardless because I never know you never know who's going to look at my art and say okay I can do it uh, I created a conference, <laughs> that Center of Black Artists. Uh, before that, I started an event called The Brush Experience. Uh, not me by myself, but a, a group of friends, um, like in 2008, uh, that was like a, a paint by numbers mural kind of event. Uh, before the painting said, folks didn't want to pay $10 to come paint at that time. <laughs> and now they paying 50 to, to drink the same $3 bottle of wine. <laughs> uh, but we wanted to engage, like I had a lot of friends graduating from our school that, you know, wanted to be artists and we didn't have a lot of places to show, the short north wasn't really like accessible like that and so we wanted to create an event that would kind of double as a way to engage people in making art and grow their appreciation for it and then hopefully like buy some art. And so for me, my response to not being seen was to help to create and curate the space spaces to be seen, uh, which sometimes kind of kind of like bait and hook. If it's not exactly like from see my art, it's like we've had to kind of work around. But then we have to create the space for us to have these conversations so that people understand artists and their role in, in the community. So for me, the response has been like not waiting to get big, but trying to create, if I don't see a space, like Tony Morrison said, who's also in Ohio. If you don't, if you haven't read a book, like write it, like, if, if there's no gallery where you are, create one, right? And then that might take you outside of yourself. But if you, if you think of art as how you approach your craft, like, then all of it is art, right? And all of it is an opportunity for us to be seen. And in the process, you are creating opportunity for other black artists, but not just black artists, and other artists um, contributing to the, to the full end, if you, if you know that. So that may not be everyone's forte, but you know, I think that is a way to uh, create the opportunity for yourself. And then, you know, the, the good part is for others as well. But it has to, that has to be included. Right? Um, <clears throat> personally, uh, I, in times where I didn't feel seen or I didn't feel the appreciation, you know, behind the work I was putting out, uh, that's what forced me to seek collaboration. That's what forced me to seek out people who were doing you know, similar work that I was doing. Uh, who naturally appreciated that type of work, even if it wasn't coming from me. And they just appreciated other creatives, you know, other people like them. So in those times, I always sought out other individuals or other safe spaces where these type of things were happening at and just found a way to insert myself into those spaces. Honestly, for me, I'm still working on not wanting to just give up, but having people Ex well, there's a whole lot of people, but I feel like especially Dr. Banner, uh, Dr. Banner, Dr. Banner and Ayana in this like space right here. Just the way that they're like, Sierra, have you thought about this? Sierra, like, look at your work and just appreciate what you're doing has really helped me. I don't know that like it just sparked something different in me. I've always loved art, but this, I don't know. It feels like I can do it. Um, and that I should keep doing it and not just like, I don't know, it's just like I'm learning how to appreciate myself and the art that I create. And it's because of the people that I've surrounded myself with and the people that can see like genuinity, genuineness, genuineness. I don't know my words, but yeah. So shout out to those people. Always there. Thank you, that word. <laughs> 
want to address the question of like what keeps you going, and I think for me a lot of it is there's really no other option. You know, um, we were talking about the past and the future. Um, there are so many people who came before me who did not have the opportunities that I have. And then for the people who are coming after me, they're not going to have opportunities unless I create those. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we in Columbus lost one of the, the great elders of the Columbus Arts community, uh, Is Said, who was a poet. Um, he wrote over 40 plays and produced them. Um, pretty much every poet who came through Columbus in the last four years was mentored by him. That's and so um, when I was at his uh, celebration of life and person after person was getting up and just attesting to how transformative he had been in their lives and how they had not thought of themselves as poets and um, I really felt the weight of the torch being passed mm -hmm. because I realized that the people of my generation would not exist without those people but uh, those people are exiting the building at this point and so in order for things to keep on going we we have to take up the torch. And nobody guaranteed us anything. So it's, it's a fight for anybody. It's a fight for anybody. And you, it, giving up is just not an option. I'm happy to answer that. Um, I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, and um, if you're familiar with Kansas City, jazz is definitely a part of that. I grew up on 18th and Vine. My grandfather was a jazz musician. Um, when most kids had bedtimes, I was at the Blue Room with my mother, who was a manager of that space, which is also attached to the American Jazz Museum, mom, okay? So she would, maybe I just left it at that. Um, so what I grew up with was this sense of improvisation. Mm -hmm. And improvisation comes not just, you're not flying by the seat of your pants. It's rooted in your history, your knowledge, and you're vibing with the people that are around you as well. So when you ask that question, that's the first thing that comes to my mind um, about my culture, is the ability to improvise and it be rooted and grounded as well to create something new. So black people, um, I really enjoy how they can make something from nothing, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just something about being able to be creative, because of the vision, mm -hmm. for the volume, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, but even like this, our, our way of communicating, right, is very important. Um, if, if we turn on like, you know, BBB or ABD for half a minute, we're black people, we're bilingual, right? We have all conversations all over here. That a lot of people may not know what you're saying. <laughs> um, but that's important because that's a tradition, right? Yeah. When you were enslaved, how can you communicate? How can you express joy, pain? Uh, you know, how can you communicate in a way that's for us? So even those types of little um, intricacies and complexities, I think, is uh, unique. Uh, not just us, but I think it's particularly unique to, to how we exist. So just our ability to thrive and survive, I think, mm -hmm. In the same sense that community aspect, um, I know for me, even if I don't know the person, say, because my family likes to travel, we'll go somewhere that's not, there's not a lot of black people there. But when we see our people, we're like, cousin, <laughs> oh my God, girl, like it's so good to see you. And it's things like that that just feel like, sometimes it just feels like an instant family. You know, yeah. it can be in a Walmart and you're just like, hanging out as if y'all have known each other your whole life and I just think like I just thinking about it right now I'm just like oh my god like I just love that about us and it just feels like so safe mm -hmm. to know that you have like your people you know yeah. so really fast so what's funny is when you walk in right you see all those uh, door mats mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you walk in here <laughs> you watch the black folks you do it like yeah. that. that's literally like you know Exactly what each one means. 
to the T, right? So it's just a little thing which, you know, are, are again, lived experience we have in this type of organization. But that's why that is, that's my little thesis. Because it was so dope. Like, <laughs> man, we've all heard that, we've all said this, you know, we just understand. Yeah, coming from Sierra, the first thing I thought of was the love that's in the culture. Um, like, I don't know you, but hey, how you doing? <laughs> or just like, I don't know, like family. Like, I am a family person. We are family people. We are lovers in my family, and we're rooted in love. But being rooted in love also comes from where well, it shouldn't. But a lot of times it comes from that place of struggle. And we're in this together regardless. So the love that you, that I feel from it, the unconditional love is my favorite. Um, this has been touched on a couple of times, but uh, the resilience, the creativity, the uh, resourcefulness to take pretty much nothing and create your own world out of it, uh, to, to you know, be given less or to, to not have the same opportunities, but find a way to make a way, uh, not just for you, but, you know, for your peers and, and like mine. Um, one word, because um, I think, just like, just like Mario just said, and, and, and Dr. Bourgeois and Dr. Banner, adaptability uh, is what I'll say, the, the ability to adapt to whatever environment we're in. Um, and, and that's why my work is rooted in the diaspora. Um, to see our culture around the world and people of, of uh, African descent around the world and their ability to adapt to their environment um, is, is always been interesting. And, and that really came to a head when I was in college because I had no idea in high school, you know, so, that's that. Uh, for me, I, I'd say really like kind of the warmth of the humanity and the generosity of the black community at its best. Um, which is not to say that doesn't exist in other communities, but I, I think there is something special in the black community. Um, and a lot of times, even like when you see a black person who isn't surrounded by a lot of other black people, they're, they're still often centering and sustaining the community. Um, and, you know, that can be a double-edged sword sometimes, but I, I do, I do value, I do value that. Uh, I, 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 I still don't, I, I would say I've written uh, in, in a very literal sense, uh, but also like I've written as everybody has said together, like with each other, like when we go to different places, um, even, even if, if you got a, a no rhythm, <laughs> you know, Negro, right? Like, uh, it's still love, right? Like, we, my son, I, I mean, my son is that he was at prom and he was, there was a video out here online somewhere of uh, him doing line dance, and he was like, man, we gotta get him. <laughs> you know, so I think, you know, our rhythm with each other, our rhythm, uh, and I think our rhythm has undergirded America. Uh, you know, we can talk about music, we can, we can go on for days about just that and what we were in it in that in dashboard, right? So I think uh, for me that's just one of the things that sort of stands out that I didn't hear somebody say that right now. So uh, the rhythm and the cadence in which we move. I love that we question. Oh, I love that part. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. sort of the things that we kind of do uh, that aren't, you know, 
separated from any other group, but but does exist uh, when we talk about like accessibility, even within the black community, um, how we classify people, gender, all of those things, right? And I think those are things that we have not reckoned with, um, you know, uh, and that we that's something internal that we have to kind of interrogate. Uh, I have a mentor that says like you know you put rubber and metal in the rain. It's going to impact both of them, but it's going to, you know, exponentially, you know, rest to the, the metal faster and the rubber is changing over a longer period of time. And so for us, the things like when you say the rains and pours, like we, we that metal, like we are, but it's, it's wearing and tearing on us and we don't feel with what's happening internally. Like that external starts to get exploited, it starts to get commodified, it starts to get, right, all of these other things. And so I think, um, but I, I'm blanketing and using word class, but I think that covers a lot of variables when we talk about like, classification and economic classification. For me, I think it's the hesitancy to be not even just accepting, but understanding of queerness in our community. I think it's so crazy. Like, we didn't choose to be Black, but some people act like we chose to be queer and instead of seeing it as like an added strength, they're seeing it as like a weakness, as something to be ashamed of, when it's like, I, I don't know, it just feels like hypocritical to be proud to be black, but then in the same breath, turn around and shame somebody for being who they are. And I think a lot of um, people in our community don't want to reckon with why they have an issue with that. Um, and I think that like, even just like talking about it, I'm just sitting here like, I don't get it. So, yeah. Why is this Oh, it's like this. That was kind of heavy. We didn't have any questions. Um, the, the best advice I received thus far was to give back, mm -hmm. find a way to give back. Um, and when I was told that I hadn't really done anything yet, and so um, it, was, it was in a way weird. It's like, you know, I, I'm not doing anything to be able to give back, but I had to look uh, within. And I looked within my household. So, like, my children are very interested in being artists, and that was the, the easiest way to start, is to kind of give them some lessons in what I do know. But then, as I, you know, started to teach, uh, that was the, that was why I used that. So it's like, okay, I'm not not making what I want to as an artist just yet. So, uh, Dewar was the one that told me to, you know, go and teach. Um, if, if you have the time for that. And that's been like super helpful because not only do I learn or do the, the children learn from me, uh, I actually learn more from them, so. One um, comment that was shared with me was that I am worth it. Mm -hmm. So whether or not that is the message that I'm trying to share, the money that I'm asking to be paid, or the time that I am sharing with someone else. Um, and, and I guess it was, it was very profound to me because, because I came from a space where it was, you were always giving, 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 and then you give a little bit more and then you give a little bit more. So that allowed me to pause and to think about what I was giving and how I could give. So that I was worth it. For me, um, advice that I've gotten, but also that I think is important to pass on, is being authentic. Whether people say it 
to you or not. Like they can tell if you're doing something because you believe in it and you're passionate about it versus if you're doing it, for example, for like a money grab. They can they can sense the difference. And I think not even just in your practice, but being authentic in the way that you feel, um, whether that's like the negative feelings, because I will say I am a crybaby, but I am like okay being a crybaby because it's like there's a connection there. People can connect to these different feelings. And um, yeah, just being authentic, I think will get you really far in life. I don't think I know. Okay. Okay. Um, the worst thing you can do is not do it. So I feel like for me, I've always been, I've always been the creative kid. I was the kid that went above and beyond on the projects. But when it came down to like, all right, you're an artist, let's be an artist. It took me a minute to actually share it. But that's because like when it when it comes to art, it comes from a vulnerable place. But it's like, number one, it's okay to show your emotions and show that vulnerability. And I think oftentimes, especially in the black community is, oh, be strong, be strong, be strong. Like, no, you don't have to be strong all the time, it's okay. And you can show your emotions and be vulnerable. So that was one reason why I didn't. But it was like, okay, just do it. Like, what's the worst that can happen? The worst thing that can happen is that you don't put it out there. And once I start actually, like, putting myself out there as an artist and doing the community work that I wanted to, it was a fast turnaround. Like, I really, honestly, I just start calling my artist, myself an artist like a year and a half ago, two years ago. <laughs> But I've been making art for a minute, and from that push, and it's like, let's take this seriously. It's crazy to see that I'm right here, right now, mm -hmm. in that matter of time. So yeah, do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my advice would be, uh, well, what I would like to say is that being an artist, being a creative, sometimes feels lonely. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're surrounded by the masses because your perspective, your outlook, how you perceive things is different than most people or that, the, the person who's not a creative or artist. Uh, but never try, never change from that because your uniqueness is what makes you special and that is what makes what you do so important and so valuable. It's because it's, it's different than what everybody else is doing. It is your perspective. It is, you know, you have that gift for a reason and the greatest thing you can do is share that gift. So I uh, quote from in Professor Robert E. C. Kelly. This is what I go to when I need some encouragement. The quote says, without the visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. We only know, we only end up confused, rhetoric, and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers and tactics, but a process that can and must transform us. So I recall that because I think artists play a very role, a uh, very integral role um, in, in creating conditions, right? And, and I think the responsibility of that is great. And I think um, if we look at ourselves in a bigger, <laughs> outside of the context of like making money and in, in, in the context of it, like creating a new world and, and world building, and our, our value is, is, you know, it's a question. If, if there's something I'd like to tell people, it's um, don't let anybody else tell you what blackness is or what you have to be to be black. And um, by the same token, I would like to also encourage us to quit policing blackness for other people. Um, a lot of times what we put on each other is not uh, original to us anyway. It's stuff that was put onto us and then that we're carrying forward. I would also like to uh, take this time since we're closing up to just 
say something to the organizers of this event, and that's just, um, you guys did an amazing, phenomenal job. I know it's a monumental task <laughs> for coming out this together, and it's so important. So thank you so much. Thank you.